I, I was um, quite shocked uh, to end up on the list in this uh, climate lab. And I have thoroughly enjoyed the presentations of um, people who have contributed uh, so far. And uh, I can honestly say that as a result of the people who've contributed so far, I've changed my presentation uh, as well, because I was really interested in um, the proposition that you've started with in the context of the lab about what changes am I going to make? What are we going to do individually? Is what it doesn't matter whether it's blue sky's thinking or how we've res, how we've managed resistance uh, against more traditional ideas or pragmatic solutions, but actually a real focus on action. And I I hope that what I'm going to do now, which I haven't done before, because it's more inherently personal than the normal um, chats I do, um, will be to say a little bit about what galvanizes action. You know, which moments in my life have been inspirational? Who has inspired me? And then how have I been able to utilize that in the context of seizing the moment? So really, this is about seizing the moment when it comes, be ready and take it on. So I hope you can all see my screen. And I just think this is a brilliant uh, way of, um, of starting uh, this talk, because just that notion about save some of the earth for me, you know, it's so deeply poignant uh, when attached to a wonderfully smiling child that we should be even having this conversation at all. And the fact we're having this conversation at this point in time ironically, is many ways, as a couple of other people have already said in this lab, almost the most hopeful time I've had in most of my adult life, where I have spent most of my adult life trying to uh, create policy for future generations. So my, some of my early inspirations have been very much about, you know, the, the, the friends of the earth in the context of thinking global and acting local. And what you see in front of you um, in this slide is what's called Science on a Sphere. It was a big exhibition and I, I think it was peripatetic, but I, I, and I think I saw it um, uh, at, at, at the London um, Museum of Science around about 2007. And what was amazing at the time, because we didn't have the kind of dig digital reach that we have now. And therefore, when you saw something happen in front of you without any wires, <laughs> it was still it was still a really interesting proposition. And this this globe, um, I was given a, a, a privileged um, uh, access to it with some other um, ministers from other parts of the U of, of, of the UK. And what we saw presented on this globe back in 2007 were three things. The first one was we saw the impact of sea level rise as modeled by climate predictions in 2007. And of course, what we know literally in the last week is that we're working on the worst possible scenario of that. We saw the impact of flooding from rivers, et cetera, because of the change in weather and rainfall. And we saw the impact of a potential pandemic in the context of a time it was looking at H1N1, but had H1N1 not been uh, sufficiently controlled, what that would look like. And what you realized in all of those was that none of those things recognized any borders, but they were all inherently as a result of human action. And so the very notion of thinking globally in terms of the planet, but acting locally became something that I uh, very much accommodated into my own psyche. And some of this is probably because I was brought up in Africa, in Zimbabwe, uh, where my father had gone to establish the first multiracial medical school in Africa at the time. And so I was there from the early 1960s till the mid 1970s. 
And there's so much about that experience in Africa that has absolutely contributed towards my politics now. On one side, there's a baobab tree, by the way. I absolutely adore baobab trees because I could never get over the fact they looked as though their roots were upwards. <laughs> so, um, but on the, one, on the one hand, it was about nature. It was about the freedom to be out in nature. Uh, and it was about the explicit instruction that I had as a child not to hurt anything. I had a stick with me in case um, I saw a snake. We saw a lot of them but it was about more to drum the path in front of you as you walk the other way, not in any way to do any damage uh, to the snake. And, I, and in my book, I talk a lot about the experience of nature. And Zimbabwe at the time was one of the three breadbaskets of the world. So it was an incredible place in which to grow up. It was so rich in terms of flora uh, and fauna. And that overabiding love of nature and respect for nature, and the absolute notion that it was nature that gave us our ability to survive in food, in shelter uh, as well, and clean water was really important to me. The other key sets of learning that came out of Africa uh, in many ways were to do with um, education. My mother um, used to be a doctor out in the bush. She worked in the clinics helping women uh, in the context of looking after their children. So her job was very much about child welfare. She's also a doctor. Um, and I used to sometimes go with her. And then, in fact, there's just a, such a wonderful story at the moment, which is um, uh, one of the clinics she used to go to in a place called Chinamora um, uh, is now, is also the home of a woman who many years later from Zimbabwe, who set up in Wales and runs a charity called Love Zimbabwe, <laughs> who remembers my mother <laughs> as a white doctor in my, in, in my childhood. But the extraordinary thing was that going to these clinics sometimes with her and seeing people, seeing kids having to share education resources when we didn't have to share education resources. And also growing up in Zimbabwe at that time, although apartheid was never a law, it was a policy. So I grew up with this really strong notion of fairness um, and anti-racism, very, very much linked um, to my uh, time in Africa. And the other, the other key element of that being brought up in, in Africa um, was actually about the fact nobody wasted anything ever. <laughs> so, and that was such an important part of my life. And the, um, when I get on to um, uh, my life a little bit later, you'll start to see some of these uh, things and why, why they're important. But the hatred of waste that I had when I came to boarding school in the UK at the age of 14 and was in this incredibly consumerist society. I mean, listening to Kerry Wilde earlier, she would have been horrified <laughs> by, by, by the fast fashion <laughs> that we had uh, in the context of, of, of that school, which was very much about parents replacing love with things uh, in that very consumerist way. But the, all those aspects, think back in your own lives about moments where absolute joy or enormous understanding of unfairnesses start to make you who you are because we all have them and they are the things that make us exactly who we are. When I first came to Wales in the um, uh, uh, in my late teens one of the things I discovered um, uh, very quickly because I would always walked and cycled everywhere, miles and miles and miles in Africa. And coming to boarding school was like being in a prison. But my first major holiday from that school was actually to go off with three friends and we walked the Pembrokeshire Coast Path. And it had been in place, I think, for about two years when we walked it. So it was very new. And this idea that you could walk the coast in this way. And it was incredible. We saw so much wildlife. What you're looking at here is about half an hour south of where I live now. I live on a coast like this. Um, uh, just before lockdown, I went through that on a kayak 
you know, this is the Green Bridge of Wales. Um, this is, you know, it is enormous what we have available to us on our doorstep. Sometimes it's a bit harder than others, but I'm always amazed that I used to visit my in-laws um, uh, close to London and their garden was full of parakeets. <laughs> so it doesn't matter where you are, there's always an incredible amount of wildlife to have access to. But just the fact that we could walk along that coastline was so privileging in the sense of being able to um, have that freedom um, and that uh, access to flora and fauna. And then the, when I went to university, um, I, studied, I studied English and, uh, and, and drama and, and, and uh, my, my sort of back up was physical education because I've always been a very outdoors person. That was when I was first introduced to Maslow's hierarchy of need. Um, and I, what interested me about that was, um, it was a time when um, there was, a, you know, it was in the, uh, in, in the late 1970s uh, and I was in university till the early 80s. So I was in university in that period of time when um, uh, Margaret Thatcher became prime minister. And I just remember um, meet, you know, meeting this for the first time. And I had a really inspirational lecture who said, who, who doesn't, because they, they weren't political uh, in the English department, but this was actually about under the soci understanding the sociology of some aspects of literature. And looking at this, and, uh, and he said, any good government will have to take care of people's physiological and safety needs. And I remember looking at them, and apart from the obvious joke about, I didn't want any government taking control of my reproduction. <laughs> it was, the rest of it was absolutely. Because why wouldn't a government provide clean air, clean water, adequate food, uh, shelter, uh, safety, um, personal security, employment, etc.? Why wouldn't a government that wanted and had aspirations around its people want to provide, it wanted to supply people's physiological and safety needs. Obviously, lots of people can do those for themselves, but if they can't, they have such a, um, a difficulty in terms of accessing all those other aspects of the hierarchy of need, love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization. Why wouldn't a government want to do all those things? And of course, post-war government did exactly that. That big vision post-war in the 1940s was about making sure that people had adequate housing, a proper health service, good quality education. Of course, the introduction of council housing at the time was absolutely massive. Um, so all those things for me were a part about what society should look like. Then I got elected. <laughs> uh, it wasn't quite as simple as that, of course. I didn't go straight from university into that. I went and taught for a, for a, a, a few years. I, 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 I was a youth worker. Uh, for a few years, but um, I became angrier and angrier at Margaret Thatcher. I was angry at what she did to the school curriculum. I was angry um, at particularly the thing that m took me into politics. Well, the two things took me into politics. The first was the um, uh, what Margaret Thatcher did to young people through the removal of statutory youth work opportunities. I mean, there won't be that many people probably on the call um, who knew that in many places across the UK, whether it was done at either local government level or at government level, that there were opportunities and it was considered a good practice to provide informal education opportunities for young people. And I believed fundamentally in that then and I still do now. And those opportunities were literally removed overnight. And also the curriculum, uh, instead of being uh, very rich in terms of what teachers could do with, with their students, the curriculum was hammered into a box uh, and made much more prescriptive. And all those things, you know, those are the things, those are the kind of influences that take you in the context of the political direction. So there we are, 1999, I got elected. And as after my election, I started to understand more around political um, changes. And what I had no idea about in 1999 was that actually back in 1992, there'd been a Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. 
And that actually, you know, what we all refer back to as that first Earth Summit in 1992 did not impact on policy across the world in any major way. A lot of people loved the principles from it. And the first principle that human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development, they are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature, felt to me absolutely sensible. Because, but the, in the really important sentence there, or the part of the sentence, is in harmony with nature. No notion that humans should control nature for uh, their own extractive ends, but very much about the fact that we are part of nature and therefore we have to behave as part of nature. And in fact, we have to curb our worst extractive instincts in the context of looking after ourselves and biodiversity for future generations. And much later, um, Satish Kumar, um, uh, who you'll hear from later, I think, uh, who is, who is a, one of my greatest inspirers, um, Satish tells me this wonderful story about um, uh, the word oikos, uh, which is the Greek uh, for home, the planet home. And uh, logos is the knowledge of the planet home and nomos is the management of the planet home. And so quite clearly, you know, if economy is the management of the planet home and ecology is the knowledge of the planet home, how can you possibly create an economy without ecology? And I think that's the territory that we're starting to get back into and need to get back into for the survival, not only of the human race, but the survival of uh, 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 other um, biodiversity as well. And it was that um, that was absolutely significant in terms of my realizing the power of politics if put into action. Because back in 1999, uh, in the year that I really discovered the impact of Rio. The reason I discovered it actually was because of that phrase, sustainable development. Because the, in, in the creation of the devolved National Assembly for Wales, the parliamentarians, the UK parliamentarians on a cross-party basis, in their wisdom, had written into the Government of Wales Act that the new National Assembly for Wales would have a duty to promote sustainable development in everything that it did. And of course, that duty then had to be defined. So then that led us to the Brundtland definition of sustainable development, a uh, development that meets the needs of current generations without compromising on future generations meeting their own needs. And and I was really, I didn't know about it when I became uh, an, assemb um, an assembly member, um, but I was so excited when I found that we had this. And here were we in Wales in 1999, the only nation um, that had such a duty. Scotland wasn't given it, Northern Ireland wasn't given it, only Wales in devolved terms was had that duty in that context. So I just thought this was absolutely amazing and set about along with all my colleagues, because I came into government in my, I spent my first year as deputy speaker, just what everybody should do in politics, because you understand the laws, <laughs> and the procedures. But I, from the second year onwards for the rest of my, my life in the um, uh, National Assembly for Wales, the 11 years I spent as minister. And I was absolutely trying to deliver on this notion of sustainable development and everything that we did. So if we just go back to that Africa uh, slide, in the context of education, one of the first things I introduced was education for sustainable development and global citizenship. Created a new curriculum, particularly for early years, uh, put a lot of that outdoors, uh, best highlight ever, minister makes children play in the rain, in, uh, in the press. Um, but also, it was about creating new opportunities. So the creation of a baccalaureate that then led on to uh, projects for Wales, Europe and the world that could be focused on sustainability. Um, hating litter, first country to get rid of carrier, uh, to get rid of carrier bags by the charge on carrier bags. And with, within four years, that was followed up by the rest of 
the UK don't believe the Daily Mail when they say they did it <laughs> because they certainly didn't influence me and, I, and we did it first. And also recycling and um, recycling has been talked about quite a lot um, in these sessions and it's not we should actually reuse before we recycle but recycling Wales is now among the best three in the world when we uh, started the National Assembly and before I introduced regulatory targets uh, Wales was bottom of the UK so there is quite possible to use a, like a combination of values and regulation to achieve political outcomes. And what is particularly exciting is the fact that that Government of Wales Act um, in 1998, that was the founding constitutional framework for the National Assembly for Wales contained this duty to promote sustainable development. But what we found in terms of trying to deliver that um, was that it's really hard. If you've got such an open definition to sustainable development, and if you have such an open definition to uh, what you have to do with it, to promote it, and that's all you had to do was to promote it, then actually, what does it look like? What does the action look like taken on, on that front? And, you know, long story short, because anybody who's really interested can pick it up in the, in, 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 in the book, um, it took then, uh, 13, well, it took, it took from 2007 when I first proposed that we should uh, put sustainable development as the central organising principle of government through to 2015 when the legislation was passed for us to try and test in government whether or not we could deliver effectively on this duty to promote. And I think that the, the death knell for that, in terms of that very general proposition, uh, was both that the Wales Audit Office told me in 2010 that despite the fact that I knew we were not putting it right at the heart of government, we had never failed on our duties for, to promote. So we'd been able to carry on business, not quite as usual, but not anywhere near the changes that needed to happen. Um, and deliver on that duty to promote sustainable development. So clearly it wasn't enough. And the other big catalyst uh, was the uh, incoming UK government uh, in 2010, uh, getting rid of the Sustainable Development Commission. And there we were, you know, in 2010, just as I'm thinking about how am I gonna take this to the next steps, the very body that I was looking to help me on that journey was removed not even removed with consultation, removed overnight. And it struck me with a force that is still, I remember uh, so well, that we couldn't possibly be in a situation where sustainable development, the very thing that looks after the interests of future generations should be subject to that kind of cursory removal. And therefore we had to protect it in law. And therefore, essentially, the core elements of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which I'm going to talk through with you now briefly, uh, we uh, very much I devised on the way back from Bristol to Cardiff. Not a long journey, but in a sense, it's something I've been thinking about for years. So the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act applies to government and to all the public services in Wales controlled by the Welsh government. There is, as part of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, a Future Generations Commissioner who is independent of government and of the public services, who is both a critical friend and, and has powers as well in terms of intervention. The public services are audited by the Wales Audit Office so that uh, they audit office leads the changes required to the auditing in terms of delivery on future generations. And very importantly, the last point, the Welsh government itself is also accountable under the Act. So unlike normal situations with government where governments make law for others, the Welsh government is accountable for responding and appropriately to this legislation. So those, those are the elements that, that I left 
um, as, a, as a sort of bomb um, in the system when I left politics, although um, the head of futures in the Welsh government said to me the other day, think of it as a bee bomb, <laughs> that, anyway, that hopefully it will cascade lots of interest in, in, in others in a, very, in a very positive way. But those, those are the elements of, of the act. Now the act has five ways of working that are in the law. So the five ways of working you see in front of you, but essentially it requires everybody in the public services in Wales to think long-term, to think preventatively, to integrate outcomes around goals, to collaborate with others to achieve, and very importantly, and to involve people about uh, whom decisions are being made. And these are the goals. So the five ways of the working are the how, now I said it's very difficult to know how to deliver if you've got a very uh, wide definition of what to deliver. But the how gives you a mechanism for delivery, uh, preventative, long, long term, integrated, collaborative, involving people about whom decisions are made. The goals are the what you might want to deliver. And these goals directly link over to the SDGs. Um, as Jojo was pointing out in her talk uh, a, a little earlier, the SDGs are voluntary. There may be 193 countries that have signed up to them, but I was shocked to find the only country that has put a mechanism to put SDGs into law is Wales, because all other countries have still got voluntary systems. And yet really, if we're really going to have um, changes in the way governments behave from now into future generations, then it needs to be the framework at the heart of government. And so these goals are the goals that are the framework at the heart of government now in Wales. And you'll see the titles on the left and these definitions are in law. And I'll put up the link um, to the essentials document um, in a moment on the, on, on the chat. But I have not yet found, and if anybody else on the call has, please show it to me. I have not yet found another country in the world that describes prosperity as innovative, productive, low carbon, living within environmental uh, limits, using resources efficiently and proportionately, generating decent wealth, um, sorry, decent work contributing uh, towards wealth. So all those aspects, the definition, mean that you would not actually at the moment have been able to open a coal mine in Wales, whereas you can open a coal mine in Cumbria, uh, because it could be challenged, therefore, in the law. And when we think then about, uh, in terms of a resilient Wales, which personally I prefer to be the nature goal, and it's not just about maintaining but enhancing biodiversity. And then when you look at the others, it's about looking upstream. It's how you understand what contributes to physical and mental wealth, as health. It's how you understand what a society that en enables people to fulfill their potential looks like. How, what, what is a, a attractive, viable, safe and well-connected community? How do you create a society that promotes and protects culture, heritage, etc.? And very importantly, so you don't offshore your carbon emissions, a globally responsible Wales, when it does any of those things, the economic, social, environmental and cultural um, uh, decisions, it takes account of whether such a thing makes a positive contribution. Now, there, 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 are, there will be people in Wales on this call, and uh, uh, sometimes me as well, who think some of these aren't quite enough, but my God, they're better than anything else, because <laughs> there's nothing else out there like it. So what I'm really keen that people do is pick these up, run with them because that is take, seizing the moment. Run with them. If you want to define them further underneath in ways that work for your organizations, for your business, for your community, do so. But hold the public services and government to account on these because they're clear enough to do so. And actions which clearly uh, transgress them uh, can be called out. Now the mechanisms are primarily through the uh, Future Generations Commissioner, as I said, who has some, uh, some powers, but 
her main function in many ways, Sophie Howe, who's a wonderful commissioner with a really great set of people in her office, um, is providing critical friendship support. Lots and lots of useful reports if you want to go and find them, uh, including a manifesto about what all parties should be looking at in the context of their manifestos for the next elections in Wales, which if, go, if they go to timescale will be held in May of this year. The Auditor General for Wales, uh, who must have had a big gulp when this became law because it's fundamentally changing how audit uh, operates and there's a lot of help from, pe from people who really want to see different kinds of audit approaches and of course the courts through judicial review. Now judicial review is a very specific type of mechanism in terms of looking at processes but remember in this case because the processes are in law it makes it much easier to hold public services to account if they have not demonstrated long-termism, prevention, uh, collaboration, integration, and involvement. And that link with the goals I mentioned before, and there's a, a specific report if people want to have a look on Welsh Government site or the Future Generations Commissioner site, there's, there's the report that demonstrates how the goals are being accommodated in Wales to deliver on the SDGs as well. But all this goes back to who you are and what you want to do and what you are prepared to do. And one of the key things that happened to me back in 2007, when I first became environment minister, was I immediately had people on my back from the press who just wanted to trip me up. You know, when did you last have a flight? Um, you know, what kind of car do you drive? What kind of house do you live in? All those, those kinds of things. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say that when you are wanting to be a sustainability advocate, you have to walk the talk. It's a roller coaster of a life. You will meet all sorts of amazing people. You will meet the best people on the planet, literally, because they're the people arguing for the future of the planet, for current and future generations. And you have to hold on to that amazing network. But you, you will meet people who are just want to, particularly as a minister, just want to bring you down. If they can de dent your credibility in any way, they'll do everything they can uh, to do so. And in 2007, I was living in a single glazed, gas sentry heated uh, house. Um, and although we were, uh, we were not taking holidays by, um, uh, by, 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 by plane, we, we were running two cars. We were not cycling enough, we were not walking enough, we were not using public transport enough. And what we decided to do was, was do one big green thing every year. Uh, we decide on it as a family. We do this one big green thing every year, whatever we decided to do uh, together. Uh, and we try and do other things as well. But the big green thing every year led us from that single glazed, gas centrally heated, uh, two diesel cars to where we are now, which is living a life, which is living off our... Uh, growing as much of our um, uh, food as we can. Um, you notice the big picture is of uh, pressing apples and the small picture on the left is the making of cider. <laughs> so there's a lot of fun associated with this. And those are, those are wild field mushrooms, but please be careful before you go and pick them. That's the cockerel wanting to be as tall as me um, when I was taking his picture, very obliging. Um, but just, you know, the pleasure we've had and actually the improvement to our quality of life by growing our own produce, both as people, we're not farmers, but we have learned over the years to do this. And also about making sure that we have our house well insulated. We have um, solar panels. Um, that was one of our big things. So the, to get the solar PV, another, another year's big thing was getting the solar thermal. And the very big one for 2020 was getting the ground source heat pump. Um, and we have a bit of woodland um, and we just determined we drive electric cars. We try and use them as little as possible. Um, we've only flown once, I think, in the last five years. And that was to a family wedding in Canada. So we're not saying never fly, but we do say fly as little as possible and compensate for your actions. We do believe in love miles and we'll probably do another visit to Canada in the next few years. Um, as well. So all of these 
things about living your passion and it makes you feel better about yourself. And also because you're doing something all the time in this, this is all about doing because growing requires a lot of doing. You actually are doing all the time. You're contributing positively all the time. And for me, it's very much about how you live a one planet life. What aspects of your life can you bring down uh, to that one planet level? And this brilliant book um, by, David, by, by David Thorpe shows that there are people who want to live a one planet life. And the top picture is from um, Lammas, the first eco village in the, in the UK, which was supported by um, my one planet development policy because in Wales you can create one planet developments on agricultural land, uh, provided you have the support of the farmer, <laughs> critical, um, who will let you have the land, um, and provided you can demonstrate within five years that you'll live a zero carbon life, and that includes the, the manufacture of the building as well. But I mean, so at the most basic level, you've got a building that costs 5,000 pounds from somebody who wants to return to the land and never use any machinery. At the bottom, you have Freiburg. Um, so all these options in between are available to people who want to live one planet lives. But what this book does is very helpfully tell people what you have to think about in energy, in water, in land, in management, um, uh, in your choices uh, in terms of taking that forward. So just in terms of my um, uh, number of actions for change, I decided to not hold 10 because I thought that, you know, we want everybody to go away with their 10. Um, and so here are just a sort of pick and mix. But I do think that doing one big green thing every year is a family activity. I would utterly recommend to everybody because it's, the debate is as good as anything. Um, and you know, what we did about recycling, what we did about not buying new, apart from when we had to, um, uh, et cetera, you know, was really, really important in, in not just our beliefs, but um, our, our, our children's development as well. That point about living your life according to your beliefs. Um, I once went to a solar factory many years ago. In fact, the solar factory from which our, um, our panels came uh, uh, at, the, at the turn of the decade. And I just asked them, I mean, there were 200 people in the room listening to a minister and I asked them how many people had solar panels and there were about four. And I wasn't really surprised when the factory uh, went under because if you're not advocating what you're doing, then in a sense, you're not spreading the word. So read, you just read. I mean, I love the fact, Alicia, that you're putting all these options up about books for people to read because you got all we need, all the ideas we can get. And some of them be practical, but often the epiphanies for me have been things like what Satish said about ecology and economy. Um, what Donella Meadows, the absolutely inspirational um, person who I've used a lot in the context of my, my book, um, uh, who, who, uh, you know, who was one of the first people to identify we were overshooting the economy. And she thought that governments would listen when given the facts. And then they didn't. And that was in the 1970s. And I was so shocked when I read that. And I, because I, I went through my early political life thinking governments would listen when presented with the facts. So we have to assume they won't listen if the facts get in the way of their interests. So how can we create a different kind of interest? So join, 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 because networking creates movements. You get new tribes, you get new supporters, um, and then hold politicians accountable for unsustainable actions. And there's not enough of this. I've been in a, so many rooms across the years. I mean, I've probably met you know, I've met thousands, maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands of people over my political lifetime. And often I'd ask people about, you know, have you lobbied your MP? And they'd be in embarrassed silence. And there'd be, once again, one or two hands up in a room of 100. So why aren't you lobbying your MP? I mean, this government's getting away with something near murder at the moment. And we're not lobbying. So you, all these mechanisms are available to us and to do it as part of a tribe um, makes it much more successful. And some of you will know on this call that um, the legislation in Wales has been picked up by um, John Bird, he who started the big issue, and Caroline Lucas, and they have um, drafted a bill that works alongside the climate and, e and ecological emergency a bill, which is also a private members bill, um, a future generations bill for England, 
Um, and it, the campaign is called Today for Tomorrow. And if anybody has had anything out of this talk, join Today for Tomorrow, because the next time that will go in front of Parliament will probably be in May. Um, but in the meantime, uh, they are working on a redraft of the bill. And all these times to redraft the bill create many opportunities for there to be much more movement. And I'll just finish by saying that, you know, people are interested in the book. It's the story. So it's, it's very, I mean, it's, I think it's going many in, in interested, but interesting for policymakers, the story in, more, uh, in, in detail about moving from a duty to promote to a law to deliver. But the story is peppered with inputs, amazing inputs from 140 people um, uh, who passionately want both Wales to succeed and it's early on its journey, but want other countries to pick up this sort of idea. And I knew that there was some traction in it when I'd been working in New Zealand, uh, in Canada, in the United States, actually asked to speak to young Republicans because they didn't feel they could talk about climate, but they can talk about future generations. Um, um, I'm you know, currently in discussions about mentoring in terms of a number of other small countries to move people onto this, which essentially is a values framework. And it's a values framework that can cross political parties um, because it will be law for all the political parties who might come in in a, in a, a Welsh general election to the Senedd, the Welsh Parliament in May, um, but also allows the political parties to deliver differently. So I may come from a political philosophy, which is about protecting the vulnerable. Others might come from a political philosophy that in order to deliver on this kind of prosperity, they're going to outsource it all to the private sector. But I don't care if what they do in outsourcing it, they have to deliver on low carbon or no carbon prosperity. So I think it's how we can get a big vision that can be interpreted in different settings. And it's just one model, but I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.